Steve Jobs says uh, he is he sees himself as the intersection at the intersection of art and science. And I would just shift that slightly and say, I think we're at the intersection of people, art, and technology. And in a way, and every circumstance is different. It's one of the great pleasures. The need to get people to want to go down was crucial here. And um, you know, people tend not to want to go down. And of course, the, what had been down here before all through the years had always failed. Well, you understood what was available below grade. And you had this terrific need to go down effectively and with a sort of, in my view, particularly with Apple, but in any case, a sort of spare vision. And you also, uh, so we looked at a number of alternatives and then it just saw, you know, I remember seeing and sketching. A cube is a really good solution, and I, you know, Steve, it's a great solution. Actually, I agree. Um, you're on the center line of this building, which isn't a great building. I mean, the one behind us, but still, it has a, a strong attitude. Um, you're across from the Plaza Hotel on Axis. Uh, you are seen in a glance as you come by on Fifth Avenue, you know, so it's got a stand forward on the corner of Central Park. So how do you simply bring people down? I mean, it's not just bringing people down, you're making a window for the underground upwards into the sky and the city. And uh, how do you do that? How do you get it just right? That's how we did it. And then we looked very hard, began to look very hard at the scale, varied it even by two or three feet. And uh, that was really interesting. And of course, by we, I mean, we did it with Steve, of course, and with uh, Ron Johnson and uh, Bob Bridger, and our, of course, ourselves. Um, how do you get that just right? It's highly intuitive. You can go through all the arguments and all the words, but in the end, it's, it's uh, good intuition. Speaking of what attributes are useful, it depends. But my first partner, Dick Powell, who retired, I don't know, he was older than I was, um, maybe retired almost 20 years ago now, 18 years. He said before he retired, he said, Peter, he meant this in a pejorative fact, uh, way. He said, Peter, you treat this corporation, which is our practice, like a hobby. He meant that as a sort of negative observation. It wasn't, because you really need, you know, you may, you have to look at things in a rather serious way, but if you lose the sort of childlike quality of looking around and imagining and, and uh, touching people, you've lost it. At least, I think, you've lost much of the uh, possibility of doing a extraordinarily good work, at least on occasion. There are so many different attributes and it affects what you do. I believe in making humane buildings, what I think of as humane. And I think of that as a sort of soft modernism. I don't mean soft-headed, just mean somewhat touchable. And I, you know, I see examples of that in the past. People that I'd find touchable. Um, beyond that, I think you must visualize well. Although I've worked for one or two architects before we started our practice, who were very good architects but couldn't draw very well. And I think it's handy to be able to draw because that means you can visualize and uh, you know you can make the connection between your body and, and what you're uh, thinking about and so on. But I think desire is the most important thing. Uh, I think we enable people at our best. For instance, you know that early house that I did for my mom and dad in Connecticut was uh, in the early 70s. Um, 
I don't think you change people, but you do, you can enable them. I think I enable my mother. And you figure, I figured her out, like in her kitchen to within six inches of really how she operated and how she liked to operate. And I knew a bit about how she understood the world and what interested her. And, and also, uh, and so gave her those opportunities. And I think whether you're dealing with a university or dealing with a, a, an individual or whatever, whether it's how they grasp a rail or how they see how the light is or how the materials, uh, you know, people see the history of a material like stone, for instance, how there's magic all around them. And I don't mean that in a superficial way, because, you know, we may think we're rational, but we're also we're emotional beings and how to affect people. So I think we can have extraordinary effect and we have to keep looking for ways to do that. Looking ahead is always hard and we do tend to misjudge often. I would say one, uh, it would be interesting to see what our present economy, what effects it has on all of us and on architect and young architects. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's all going to be negative. You know, some people can say, oh, it's going to be terrible, it's going to put us out of business, everyone's going to lose their job. may be true. But that, too, will somehow be an opportunity. I don't mean a crass opportunity. I mean, it will open other doors. As long as there are people, there will be a need or a desire, and a need, therefore, for uh, help from people like us, whether to sort out the world and help uh, shift it and the most mundane challenges on one hand which are often fascinating and on the other uh, for to make places that are emotionally um, compelling and again are uh, enabling. I don't think people are going to lose that now. Maybe those people won't be called architects someday, and maybe they will, and undoubtedly they may be a bit different, but I believe those requirements on money on the technical and, and uh, sort of somewhat sensible, in quotes, uh, needs, or, and on the other, the issues of people, emotion, emotional qualities, um, are going to be with us as far as we can see into the future. And therefore, there's a world for all of us.